Well, good morning, everyone. So, is it day four already? It flies by, doesn't it? So, a couple things you need to know about me. Number one, um, I bring up a box of Kleenex. It is not for looks. I will cry. <laughs> just going to let you know right now. Uh, feel free to judge me, um, and it's on you. So, just going to let you know. <laughs> Who's having a great feast so far? <laughs> Amen. Praise, praise be unto God. The feast is so, um, I see so many parallels in the feast in my life, and uh, it feels a lot of times like day number one, pretty excited, right? It's like day number one, I can't wait to see what God's going to do in the feast, it's going to be so exciting, and then it's day two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, I, I'm trying to, there's not nine days, but I'm trying to hold on, but it flies by, doesn't it? So right now, we're in the middle of it, I want everybody just to take a breath for a couple reasons. Everybody take a deep breath all at the same time. Let it out. Number one, praise be unto God for the breath that he gives us. Amen. He fills us up and gives us life. Amen. But number two, how important is it when you're going through something that's exciting, that's fun, enjoyable, that you take a moment and just breathe it in? Because too often, we just blow right by it, don't we? Or we get caught up in the moment we don't appreciate for what it is. Um, for those of you who have children... I have, I think, four. Pretty sure I have four. Uh, they grow up quick. They grow up real quick. But while we're enjoying this, while we're fellowshipping together, I just want to start with a, with a prayer today. So just bow your heads. Father in heaven, thank you for today. Thank you for, for all that you are, for you are worthy of praise. And we have come to worship you. We have come to spend our time just bowing at your feet. We desire to be yours more fully, and we ask your blessing over today. Help us to be pleasing in your sight, not just our heads or our hearts or our words, but everything that we do. Help it to be in accordance with your will, and we ask this blessing over us, not because we are worthy, but because you are, and we give thanks in advance, for you are always thankful. You are always faithful. So we ask this prayer, we give this praise in your name, and ask it in the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. All right, so day four, what's that mean? How many of you have felt the, 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 the spirit with you at all this feast? I mean, for me, it starts with the praise, and uh, both the special music and the praise today were truly inspiring. I mean, it's been day after day after day. I don't know how they do it. Um, I got a little carried away, and uh, where's Cameron? Cameron, when you hit that note, where it was a day and night, night and day, and then the next line, I think it's uh, let the incense arise. I was, trying to hit, I was trying to arise and hit that note. I don't have that note in me, but I was trying to hit it every single time. I felt a little bit inspired, and hopefully everyone else was loud enough around me that they didn't hear me trying to hit that note, because there are many things that God has gifted me with in this life, um, according to his uh, grace and mercy. Uh, hitting that note is not one of them. I, I do not have that in me, so... So if we feel his Holy Spirit now, and we're dwelling in it, and we're looking forward to the day when he returns, and this is going to be, this is going to be our every day, right? So the question I have, and this, this, I think of this often, what's it going to be like when I go home? A lot of times we don't want to think about what happens after the feast, and a lot of times we're going home to a fellowship or a community where we are fed, and we are inspired, and we are filled with the Holy Spirit. And I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. Normally I do, but I'm, I have been in the boat to where I can be surrounded by people who are godly and who are a community that lifts me up, and I still feel empty. And I know that that is common in all of us at times, to where we feel like we are not fulfilling His, his purpose. We don't have a connection. Or, or we don't feel a purpose, or we feel isolated, or even when we're surrounded by people. And it's easy in this time for us when we start and we're surrounded by all of these fellow believers, 
And every single day, whatever activity we choose to do, we can be with those who love God the way we do. And then we go home. And what changes? Work, kids, school, every single thing. Every, it feels like obstacles sometimes. I call this, uh, uh, and please do not use this ever again because it's, a, it's not a, uh, a good phrase, but this is the, the day of the feast, this is the day of the plains. And the purpose of that, I mean, is, is, is we, have, we have highs, right? We have day one as a high, and we get over that high, and we start to level out, and it starts to blend together, and then we have that last day where it's very emotional. But a lot of times for me, day three, four, five, six, it feels like it's a plane, What's filling me up? In my life, I'm going through a plane right now. And you ask, what does that mean? Same thing. Um, for those of you that don't know, uh, I was diagnosed with stage four renal cancer um, just over a year ago. I was told that I had three to five years to live. Um, when come to find out, they actually don't always know what they're talking about. Um, I do have stage four renal cancer. Um, but I'm off of my chemo. Um, I will be here as long as God decides that I'm going to be here and not a day after, um, as long as I don't like go jumping off of buildings or things like that. I mean, there, there is, <laughs> but when I got that diagnosis, the first thing that I did was I thought of God. And when I go through my treatments, the first thing I do is I think of God. And when I get bad news, I turn to God. And when I get good news, I turn to God. But what about every day in between? Because every day in between makes up most of our lives. It's easy to feel happy when the day you buy a car, right? I mean, if you have the money for it. It's easy to feel great when you're out on the lake. But what about when you're at school? What about when you're at work? And God does not feel close to you. Is God any different? No, we know that. God... The glory of our God is that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And, and we see that. It, I'm not going to read it, but in Leviticus 23, we get invited to his feast. And for those of you who haven't, I, uh, let's turn over to Zechariah chapter 14. In Zechariah chapter 14, we see at the end of times... Zechariah chapter 14... And verse 16 it says, And it shall come to pass that everyone who is left of all the nations which come, came against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. So at the very beginning, he invited us to fellowship and keep his feasts. And upon his return, we're all going to be doing it. Well, for us right now, we're doing it in between. But I don't know if any of you have ever heard somebody say, well, it was holy then, and it's going to be holy again, but it's not holy right now. That's not my God. My God is not a part-time God. Our belief is not a part-time thing. But that being said, there's a lot in between the excitement of that first love and the day that we look to. So what's going to get us through it? Right now, we feel filled with the Spirit, don't we? We feel overwhelmed because every morning, every day, you know God is going to hit you with something new. It's going to move you. It's going to overwhelm you, and you're going to be surrounded by people that you're seeing change. You're seeing the joy of the Lord in their faces. Well, if that Holy Spirit is in us, and it was given to us upon baptism, where does it go? Why do we not feel it more? Now, I'm going to ask a lot of questions today, and I hate to be the one to break it to you. I don't have all the answers. My kids will tell you that. I like things orderly. I feel like I'm a, uh, well, until this morning, I felt like I was a, um, somebody who likes to follow the rules. I like things orderly. Uh, and then I realize um, I live pretty recklessly. Every day, I don't know if you guys have ever used uh, Q-tips before. Specifically on the box, it says, do not put them in your ear. I live my life on the edge. I put Q-tips in my ear every day. That's right. I make no apologies for it either. 
I feel like if they didn't want it to go under our ear, they wouldn't have made them that size. <laughs> but I like things that I understand. I like things that are straightforward and make sense. And in my life, the Holy Spirit is not like that. The Holy Spirit cannot be contained by what I see or what I observe or, or, or what I expect. And that's how our God works. He has over and over and over again. And we read the scripture and we think, God is going to make a miracle. And miracles do not look like I expect. Because I read scripture and I think, when God fights a battle, I think it's going to be like David and his mighty men. And Joshim, he's going to slay his 800. And Eliezer, he's going to stand in the past them on and he's going to stand up for his people. These are the things that I see. And Shema is going to be the example and inspiration to the soldiers. And then God says, Gideon out. He's like, don't take swords. Take a pitcher and, um, you know what, some fire and a horn. And only take a few, few guys with you. And I'm thinking, what? That's not how you fight a battle, God. I've got all my Lego guys and my Playmobil, and they're ready to fight a battle. And they ain't blowing horns at each other. I was growing up expecting very different things in my life. The Israelites, when they, when they overcame Jerusalem, or uh, Jericho, at, at the calling of their God, did it look like a normal siege? No. Because our God does not look like things that we expect because we look at things from a human perspective, don't we? Now, I'm going to go on a limb. I myself have made mistakes before. Sometimes I make them every day. I know not everybody has that problem. Some of you all got it figured out. But it is such a blessing to us that things do not look the way that we want them to because we do not do things the way that he does. We are not wise like him. His thoughts are above us. We, all, we know all of these things. But in my life, I expect God to work with me through the Holy Spirit in ways that I understand, in ways that I'm comfortable with. I don't know if any of you have that same expectation, but that is not God's desire for us. God is calling us to do something that is very different from what we want. He is calling us to live in a way that is very different than what we are comfortable with. When I go home, a lot of times, my focus gets back on the world, right? We have catch-up to do. Anybody ever thinking, hopefully, hopefully not too much, but you think about what you might be having to do when you get back. Those thoughts creep in your brain a little bit when you're at the feast, and you think, why can't we just feast for, for forever? That day's coming, but it's not right now. So the Holy Spirit working in us, if it is in us, which it is upon baptism, why do we not see it more often in our lives? And again, I want to go back to our expectations because our expectations, um, a lot of times we try and fit God in the box that we've made, don't we? We think this is what God's going to do. We read, in, and you don't have to turn there. I'm going to go through a few scriptures. I, have about way, I always do this. I have way too many scriptures to turn to all of them and read all of them. As much as uh, you may or may not like hearing me, no one wants me up here for an hour and a half. But in John 14, 26, we read, His Holy Spirit will teach us and remind us. In Romans 8, 26, it intercedes for us. In 2 Corinthians 3, 17, we read that where the Holy Spirit is, there is liberty. In Romans 6, 15, 13, we abound in hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Does this sound like your day-to-day -day life when you go home? Sometimes it does. But more often than not, when I am not surrounded by God's people, when I am at work, when I am doing whatever it is that takes up my time, that is not the impact that is having on my life. And I feel far from him. And I know he never turns from me, so that must be that I am turning from him somehow, in some way. And more often than not, when I think about it, when I focus on it, I know I get in the way. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I'm going to ask you, and I want you to think, how many of you have sinned before? And how many of you will sin again? 
your perspective on what that sin is and what that means in your life can so often dictate your relationship with God. When I was younger, I used to think that if I sinned, I needed a timeout from God. I have to get right before I go back to him. And the older I got, the more I realized how wrong I was. I cannot get right without him. There is no getting right before I go back to him because he is the only thing that is right. So I would, I would spend my time sinning, and then I would spend my time away from him, trying not to sin, and then when I got to a point, whatever, however long I thought in my twisted brain that I was apart from him enough and I removed from that sin, then I would go back to him. And the whole time, he was probably looking at me like, what are you doing? But this is our lives, is we have a way of dealing with things. We have a paradigm, a view of this world, and so many times it is based on our personal experiences, not of God, not of the Holy Spirit. And when we try and look at him through that lens, we see him very dimly. He is not designed to be seen in that way. He is designed to be seen as an overwhelming, overpowering light because that's who he is. There is no light without him. So when I go back, when I, when I desire him, am I getting in his way? Am I getting in between what needs to be done and how I'm going to do it? The accuser has a lot of different ways of making us feel bad about ourselves, doesn't he? But oftentimes, that is merely just by separating us from that who brings us peace and joy, telling us we're not worthy. But we're not. We knew that from the jump, from the very beginning. But we don't have his Holy Spirit. We don't have him in our lives because we are worthy or we are not. It's because he is worthy. It is merely the acceptance of reality. When we worship God, does that make him greater? When we don't worship God, does that make him lesser? No. Because he is overwhelmingly good all of the time. The times that we are in alignment with his will is merely the times that we acknowledge through his Holy Spirit how great he truly is. And we do things that seem foolish according to our eyes because we love him so much. Sometimes some people apparently try and hit notes when they're singing that they shouldn't be hitting. I don't know anybody who does that, but... What I want to ask all of you is, as we are through this middle section of the feast, that you start to think about what is going to be different about your life. I want to ask you to think about how you are going to do things differently. And I am under no illusions that I'm going to be able to inspire any of you, or that I'm going to be able to change your mind or talk you into it, because that is 100% between you and our God. All I want you to do is realize how much he loves you and that when you fall short, you are not alone. Every single one of us does that every single day. When I was younger, I used to, uh, we used to go to the beach a lot for, for the feast um, because, and, and this, is a, this is neither good nor bad, but when I was younger, I grew up in the feast. Uh, I've, I've kept it my whole life. Um, and that's actually one question I want to ask. Is this anybody's first feast? Awesome. Welcome. Praise be unto God. There's nothing like the first one. Nothing like it. So I'm excited for you. How many of you have gone less than five years? That's awesome. Less than 10. Well, actually, that would be all the same. How about 10 or, 10 or more? 10 or more at the feast? 20 or more? That's good that you're not that old. 30 or more? 40 or more? Well, I'm at 46, so that's as far as I'm going to go. <laughs> it's different every year. But when a, my family and I, we would go to the feast... Um, we would often go to the beach because it's the only vacation that we kind of got. And so it combined like an exciting place that we would go uh, as well as a time to look forward to the kingdom of God. And my dad loves the beach. Uh, 
he, he loves the beach. When he retired, he thought maybe he'd come live near us and his grandkids, and he's like, I'll be on the beach. <laughs> and I'm like, I am glad for you. <laughs> but I would go out into the ocean, and uh, that was how I would start my feast. I would go out and I would look, and uh, just a glimpse of the ocean every year would remind me how small I was. How, according to this world, how insignificant that I am. And then I would think that God set aside from the very beginning a time to tabernacle with me. And that would get me off, usually, on the right foot. To remind me that I was there to worship him. Now, I'm not going to lie to you and tell you that all 46 of my feasts have been filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, I was a teenager once, and I apparently made some mistakes. I have no memory of these things. <laughs> but as I got older, and our feast turned into something different, I was filled with a desire to have his spirit and it wasn't until um, we went to Rock Valley for the first time when we, my wife and I really felt like we had a, a, a spirit-filled feast. And it was such a blessing. It was so different. Every year then it became, we're going to go there and not try and figure out what exotic location or beach or amusement park that we would be next to. But every year... I would feel that sense of loss when we would leave. And I realized that my faith often, oftentimes was dictated by my circumstances and not my, by, by my belief or my God. Circumstances change all the time, don't they? It's easy to praise God when everything's going well. And it's easy to turn to God when you have nowhere else to turn. But what are you going to do every day in between? If you're waiting for some big majestic event, that was a really weird way of saying majestic, but I'm going to move on. Let's go past that. It would be really easy for us to just say that we're going to do that when we have the highs and we have the lows. And that's not what true love is. And that's what God desires from us. He desires that we hunger and we thirst for his Holy Spirit so that he can work through us and he can do things through us that we do not want to do. It's easy when we look back at scripture and we see the, the miracles of the Old Testament and the miracles that, that Jesus performed and we think, that's not like us. That's not what we're told. We are filled with that same spirit. But then we look at them and we think, well, I'm not like Abraham. I'm not like Moses. One of the great disservices this world has ever done was make us all think that Charlton Heston is Moses. <laughs> he, he's overwhelming as Moses. He's got that majestic beard. And he's walking around and talking. Let my people go. Have you read the scripture with Moses? <laughs> Moses was like, I'm not going to talk to Pharaoh. I, 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 I can't speak well. And God said, I will not be denied. Your brother will go with you. So if our perspective is such that we think that we cannot do what they have done because we don't look like Charlton Heston or sound like him, we are missing what God is capable of doing. He has a desire for each and every one of us that we are willing to submit ourselves to him and step out into faith. But that's not comfortable, is it? I'm not going to ask for a lot of show of hands, but I am going to ask for one on this one. This is always my test. Who's still awake? How many of you like being comfortable? Who likes to be comfortable? Ever. Ever. Not all the time, just ever. Come on, hands up, hands up. Okay, so far we're doing so good. We like to be comfortable. This is the state of being in our flesh. God does not want us to live and dwell in our flesh. 
he has transformed us and turned us into beings of spirit. And we are led by that spirit to step out and do things that make us uncomfortable. That may be speaking in front of other people, which apparently is the largest fear that people have in the world, speaking in front of other people. And I'm like, man, I am not that smart because I am not afraid to speak of other people. I have lots of other fears, but that's not one of them. Does that make me any different than any of you? No. God makes every single one of us different. One of the things about my walk in the church is realizing that it doesn't matter what direction you face when you praise God, we are all the same. Standing on a stage or on the same carpet as everybody else when they're sitting down does not change who you are. It does not change how you should be treated, and it does not change how God sees you. He sees you for who he created you to be, and he has a desire that you are so willing to follow him that you will do things that will make you uncomfortable. Let's turn over the, to the love chapter in, in uh, first, uh, first Corinthians chapter 13. One of the things that we often struggle with is that we think that when God desires to work with us and do things through us, forgive me, that it will look like what we expect. And the very nature of our faith is, is, leads to that, if you will, because we are, we are different. Are we not? Not everybody's keeping the feast right now. Not everybody keeps the Sabbath. So our very nature of understanding is that God has let us know that this is his desire that we follow him. And we will for generation upon generation. Well, hopefully you're not like me, but at some points in my life, I have listened to those people in some of the churches that I've gone to, and they have told me, that I am better than everybody else because I have come to this knowledge. What foolishness that is. Did I earn any of the things that God has taught me? No, not one. If there was an IQ test to get in the kingdom of God, let me tell you, I would be helping people through the line. I would not be going. It is not by our wisdom, it is not by our anything that we have been given this gift. It is by our God. But so often we read... Chapter 13 and verse 1 of 1 Corinthians. Though I speak with tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I have become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. Though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but I have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all of my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Our desire for the Holy Spirit so often is that when God works with us, it will be evident to other people. And this is a very natural human response. God's going to give me the Holy Spirit. I will prophesy. I will speak and do things impressively. Why? That he might be glorified or that we might be glorified? Because if it is a desire in our flesh for us to be glorified or set apart so that others can acknowledge who we are or what we are doing, it is as nothing. This is what he is disgusted with. And this is what is so hard in this walk because we do things differently that we think that we are set apart and special because of who we are. No, we are set aside because he is for us. He has said that we are his people because of how we are willing to submit ourselves to him. So doing so in spirit will not lead you to great things according to the understanding of men. It will not lead you to great things that will cause other people to look at you and say how great you are. If we are serving him, if we are doing so and following his spirit, 
it will point towards God every single time. One of the mistakes that I make when I go home is oftentimes I think about what I need to be closer to God. What will make me feel closer to God? Because my focus is on myself. What God is asking us to do. Well, let's let's see. Let's see. How how does how do we know? How does how do we let people know that we are God's? Let's turn to John chapter 13. There are many examples, and I encourage you to look it up. I encourage you to find what God says about his people. What defines them? What makes them his? John chapter 13 and verse 35. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Not if you do great things. That can be the byproduct of it sometimes. But if you have love for one another. And we know this conceptually. Mark chapter 12 and verse 30 and 31, we read when Jesus is asked, what are the great commandments? Who knows what they are? Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. I hate to be the one to say it, but oftentimes that middle part gets removed. I love God. I love myself. My neighbor sometimes gets left behind. If I'm going home and I'm desiring his Holy Spirit to work through me, my focus has to be on him and those around me. Our God is not one who pulls people up to his level. Our God is one who gets underneath and lifts us up. And that is not how this world understands things. When Jesus came back, they, they, they expected him to be very different, didn't they? They expected him to fit what they thought the Messiah should look like. To be laying down the law, to be destroying evildoers, to set up his kingdom. And he came back to be a servant, to make himself like those who seem unworthy to the world, that he might lift those up. Are we, are we doing that? We have more blessings in this time of history than any other generation. And we find more ways to focus on what we don't have than I think is possible. I have to be honest about this. Um, one of my favorite times of uh, the year is the fall or the feast. But for most of my life, it has also been because of baseball playoffs. I'm going to own that. That has been a struggle in my life is putting things uh, up there that I enjoy uh, and look forward to on the same level. And uh, it was a very traumatic event this year when the TV carrier that we had no longer carried the MLB network. I'm glad no one laughed. That was very important that you do not. Like I said, it was traumatic. And we had decisions to make. And we prayed hard about it. And we found another TV carrier that carried the MLB network. Because I do not like to not have the things that I want. And I like sitting and watching a baseball game. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with doing that. However, am I spending more time watching baseball than I am focused on God? Focused on my family? focused on the things that matter. It's easy to look at other people and the things that they enjoy doing and say, well, I would never do that. That's a waste of time. We all have our wastes of time. We all have our ways of dealing with this world. And so often when we go back, we fall back into those patterns of behavior that make us feel comfortable. And I pray, I pray that all of us do better than we normally do. But whether it be food, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but has anybody ever ate th something for comfort? Whether it be entertainment, a distraction from the world, I don't want to think about all the things that I have to deal with, so I'm going to be distracted for a while. 
whether it be the desires of the flesh, I want to feel things differently and this makes me feel good about myself, whether it be alcohol, I want to change my state temporarily, whether it be drugs, whatever it may be, we all have things in our life that we use to feel better. And we can know that they are temporary. And it's really easy to judge everybody else when their crutch isn't this look, doesn't look the same as yours. We might know what's best for us, but we don't choose it. And we think, well, yes, it's hard in the spiritual world because we're of the flesh. Things of this flesh, we know what's best for us and we don't choose it. How many of you know that if you eat well, exercise, and sleep, you'll feel better? Now, how many of us do that every day? Yeah, I was hoping for somebody so I could hang out with you more often. <laughs> we know what we need to do, both in this world and the one that is to come. The challenge is, is are you willing to take the steps necessary and be uncomfortable until that day. Because I tell you right now, I'm not a prophet, but if you are not willing to do things for God that will make you uncomfortable, you are not fulfilling your calling. He desires you to be different than who you were when he called you. And that is why he gave us the Holy Spirit, that we might be transformed, that we might be changed from who we are in this flesh. This is not a temporary time where we are here to enjoy this. This is a time where we are being refined in the fire of this world. We are going to be tested like no other generation. But we were born for this time. It's easy to say, I wish I lived in other times. Everybody does that, especially people who don't understand how much they rely on air conditioning. We live in Texas. None of us would make it. But we were born for this time because this is God's plan. And he does not make mistakes. He does not want you to be something other than you are. He wants you to become who he made you to be. And he wants you to be a part of his plan. But he will not be denied. And if we are not going to get on board, then the river keeps flowing. And so many times in our lives we think, I just want God to take me down to the river that I might be filled. Our God can bring that river from a rock. There is nothing that is impossible for him. So stop expecting him to do things the way that you want and understand that what he desires, what he requires, is that we surrender to him, that we might be his. We don't have to figure out the details. He's already got it done. He set aside these days, these very ones that we understand and we are a part of, from the beginning, and they will be there at the end. It's not because we all decided that this would be a good idea this time of year. It's that generation upon generation upon generation, he is the same, and he is calling you and I to live in a way that is different from what this world looks like. And that's not for just this period of time where we are gathered together. When we go back, we cannot go back to our churches and say, I hope I get filled up in that same way. You have the Holy Spirit in you that it might flow from you and you might change other people, that you might fill what is needed. Your church may not be perfect. Guess what? It's because you are there. <laughs> the only churches that are perfect are the ones where people don't go to. So stop going to church to be filled. He has filled you with his spirit. But we have a stifling in our flesh that it is different and we do not understand it. And it is one that is, it is not godly. He wants us to understand what is possible through him. And we read about these miracles in scripture. We read about what is possible and we say, that's not me. How do you know? How do you know? Do you know what's coming? Who can tell me what's, what's going to happen tomorrow? We have plans. We have ideas. And they may or may not happen. It is according to the will of the Lord. If he says something is going to happen, it will. It will. There's no changing that. And we know that in our heads. But do you know it in your heart? 
Because if we want to worship him in spirit and truth, which is what we are called to do, and we know this to be true, it is so easy to have that truth and say, I don't understand the spirit, but I go to church every Sabbath. I don't feel moved, but I know I'm meeting the requirements because I don't eat pork. Or I go to the feast. Or enter our excuse here. He has no interest in that. None. No interest. You think the Pharisees weren't keeping his law? You think the Pharisees were doing things where like, well, look at all these unholy Pharisees. No, according to the wisdom of man, they were doing everything. And he says, if our righteousness does not exceed that of the Pharisees, then we think we're justified by our works. Our God has a desire that we want him more than anything else in the world. And I've heard it said, if I was just born in the time of Jesus, I would see him and I would see his miracles and I, I would be different. No, you wouldn't. No, you wouldn't. Our hang-ups, our limitations are individual to us, but they are exactly that, what keeps us from being his. It is when we learn to overcome those things, not by our strength, but by his by his overwhelming grace and mercy, that is how we have that connection with him. Let's turn over to the book of John. John chapter 7. John chapter 7, uh, 37 and 38. And I apologize. I, I'm, uh, I'm going to go quickly on this. So, But it says, In that last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, That any, if any man thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He that believeth on me, as Scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And we think, how great would that would be that if I could have the Spirit flowing through me? We miss the point of that verse. Why is the rivers of living water flowing from us? For our neighbor, for our brother, for our sister. If we are desiring it that we might be filled, it will go right through us and out. He is desiring that we do that so that we might spread his gospel that we might go and give his word to those around us, not by our grace or our glory or our wisdom or our anything, but by his. We are called to be a conduit for him. There's a song that uh, Nicole Norman sang. She said, I, I want to be like the moon. I want to reflect your light. Too often in our lives, we want to be the light. We are not the light. He is the light, and he shines through us. And the times where we go dim, it is not by a failing of his. Let us be that conduit. Let us ask for his Holy Spirit to fill us. Not that we might be satisfied and we might go off and live by ourselves on acreage, which does sound nice, but that we might interact with one another and fill each other up. Not going to church seeking for others to fill those God-sized holes in our hearts, but that we might go knowing that he has filled that and that we are to share that grace, that glory with other people because that's what we're called to do. How badly do you want it? How badly do you desire the Spirit of God? How badly do you want it? I'm asking you right now, do you want it more than anything? Do you want it more than anything in your life? I'm not asking for an emotional response right now to make me feel good. That doesn't make me feel good, though. Please keep doing that. <laughs> but I'm asking for it because I want you to honestly think about that. How many of you have ever been a kid or have had kids? I should see every hand who's awake. <laughs> I have four children. One of them really likes to go on water slides. One of them, when she asks me to go on water slides, she will ask me to go on water slides every single second until we go on water slides. That is how we have to desire his spirit. Every single moment. God, give me your spirit. You're not ready. God, give me your spirit. God, 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 God. I want you in my life. But because of our human perspective, so often we say, well, that's not his will for me. He might be saying, how bad do you want it? 
I had someone ask me, I had a, I had a friend who was, uh, who was not on the walk. And uh, I had another friend ask me, why do you keep inviting him to church? Why do you keep wanting to involve him in things of the church? And I told him, because I will invite him for as long as I want somebody to invite me. If I'm doing something wrong, I want someone to ask me every day of my life to do the right thing. And he said, you've been doing that for years. And I'm not saying this because I am anything good or, or worthy of praise, but because I understand how fallen I am in my flesh. And every single day, I will pursue them. Every single day, I want them to have the promise that he has given me. It is there for the taking. Do you want it in your life? Do you want it? And how badly? So growing up, I played a lot of sports. Anybody ever play a sport ever of any kind? <laughs> I like easy questions. Does practice make you better? Does that repetition make it easier for you to do as well as you can? Absolutely. We're aware of this. But too often in our lives, we think that we ask God for one thing one time, and if he doesn't give it to us according to our timing, it must not be his will. He has told us his desire for us. He has told us he wants to give us good things, and not the things of this world that we anticipate, like cars or jobs or houses. Those may come, and there's nothing wrong with that. But the promise and the blessing that he wants to give us is that his Holy Spirit works through us and transforms our lives, not just while we are here, not just while we are worshiping him, not while he is tabernacling with us and looking to what is to come, but every single day leading up to that, because that is our lives. The feast, as much as it represents what is to come, is not our life. It is a glimpse of what is to come. It is a shadow. It is a pale representation. I cannot imagine how glorious it will be when he returns. The creator of fun will be there to tell us what we get to do. You think the games that we play are good? Wait till he decides what we're going to do with our time. You will never be bored, I guarantee it. But while we're here, we're thinking, oh, I can't wait for this time to come. And then we go back and we go back to our daily lives. That is not what we are called to do. That is not who we are called to be. And we know this in our brains, but do you know it in your heart? I pray that you all do. I pray that I remember that. I also guarantee you I will fall short in the future. I used to think that life was like trying to go in the ocean. You ever go in the ocean when the waves are big and you're trying to get past the break? For those of you who've never been to the ocean, the waves don't stop. They knock you down. And you have to get back up, and you have to go, and you have to go, and you have to be relentless, and you have to never give up. God is on our side. We are not trying to get into the ocean. We are the waves. We are relentless. We are asking him for that which he will give us, and we will never stop, not once, for the remainder of our days. And why is that? Because we have been transformed by his spirit. And whether we acknowledge it now and we have it for the remainder of our fleshly days or whether we become aware of it later in our lives, that is entirely up to you and your relationship with God. But I'm telling you right now, your life will have so much more of an impact. Your life will be so much better than you can anticipate if you take those steps right now and desire him every single day. How many of you drink coffee? I'm going to be super judgy here right now. How many of you forget to drink coffee? Sometimes there's a couple of you. The majority of you don't want to start your day without that coffee. I'm not like that. I don't have that problem. I've got way other problems. Don't get me wrong. Our desire for God has to be like your desire for coffee. If you want it every day, if you need it every day, if you have to get, have it to get through your day, that is God. Multiplied by more by a higher number that I can, I'm not going to make that joke. I had a good Joe Biden joke there with a number that I'd never heard before, but I'm not going to make it. <laughs> I'm 
every single day. That has to be our desire. Not because you're in the mood, not because you feel like it, not because you're being fed, not because you're hungry, not because it fits in with your schedule, not because of anything else, but because that is who you said you are. That is who you said you want to be. You are not there yet. I am not there yet. But we must be relentless, and we must be like that little child asking, Father, how about now? God, how about now? How about you give me your spirit now? How about you give me your spirit? How about now? How about now? How about now? Relentless. And he will not deny you what is good because he is for you. And I want you to think about what that really means, how important that is. We understand that our God is great. Can everybody agree? Amen? The maker of the heaven and the earth, if he's on your side, what can stop you? If he is filling you with his spirit, what can get in the way? There is not one thing in this world that will stop his plan. And we're either on board or we're going to be left in the wake. His desire is for you. He has a plan for you to do his will. And I used to think that I would do it when I was older. I don't know if any of you ever thought that. I had my teens planned out. I had my 20s planned out. And I'll get to God when I've experienced all the things of this world. Madness. Madness. That is one thing that my diagnosis reminded me. You don't know how long you have. And none of us do. I'm dying. And so are you. Some of us, it'll just take a really long time. But you are dying in this flesh right now. And no part of it will give you peace or joy. Accepting that which we have with the Lord. And he has given us a gift that is beyond measure. And he's just asking you to ask him for it. He's asking you to desire it with everything that you have. And it still won't be enough. But he fills in the gaps with his grace and mercy. He knows when we fall short. There's things that we're going to do that will cause us shame and, and make us feel like we'll never be his again. But there's nothing, not one thing, that can get between you and the love of God. Not one thing. Have any of you ever felt unworthy before? I have. It doesn't matter what I do. I'm not worth it. Then why does Satan desire your soul so much? And why does his desire for your soul pale in comparison for the desire that God has for you? God set, me forth, set forth a plan from the foundation of the earth that he would make you his he would send his son because he knew that was needed, because he knew we would fall short. He would do everything in his power to put it out there. God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. Not that he might come into it to condemn it, but he might save it. He wants you. He wants your heart. He wants your soul. And it's already his. It's already all in the palm of, our, of his hand. All he's asking you to do is acknowledge that. To understand that you are his. To give up what comes naturally to you. And you think, I can't do it. No, you can't. Not on your own. There's not one thing that you can do to earn it. But the price has already been paid. If any of you had a winning lottery ticket, you do the numbers, and you had a billion dollars coming to you, would you not go pick it up? Would you not go pick it up? All of us would. We think about all the things that we would do. I would have an island. I would be a, a dictator, perhaps, but a, <laughs> but a benevolent dictator. And, and life would be so much fun. I would have activities planned every day. I thought a lot about this. Activities planned every day. 
and there would be one spot less than all of my friends who were there, and every day they would have to compete to be a part of that day's activity. And if they didn't make it, they'd have to clean the pool or the racetrack or whatever it was. See, I put a lot of thought into that. But the lottery ticket that we have in our spiritual life is waiting to be claimed. He's waiting for us to accept that and to say, I want that more than anything. And I want to encourage each of you because there's going to be times where you say, that's me, and you're on that path, and you're sticking to it. Praise be to God. But there are going to be times where you're going to fall short, and you're going to think, I've known the right thing to do, and I haven't done it. Why is that? Brian's message hit home so much with me yesterday. Because growing up in the church, you know what is right. You know what to do. And then we don't do it, and we think, why? What's wrong with me? You're a human being. That's what's wrong with you. But not designed to stay as such, but designed to be transformed into a spirit that will dwell forever with the king of the universe. So whether you are on the right path right now or you are struggling, it is never too late. It is never too late. God rewards the workers whether they are there in the morning, whether they are in the afternoon, or they show up at the end of the day. And that does not make sense according to my sense of justice. And praise God for that. Because if we are reliant on my sense of justice, we'd be living on an island with a benevolent dictator. <laughs> so praise God for this opportunity. Desire him with a passion, with a heart that cannot be quenched. It is in you. It is in you. Know this. Believe this. Not for a moment, not for today, not for this feast, but every single day for the rest of your life, and your life will be better for it. I so desperately wish that at my very best, I could remember that and hold on to that. And I don't because I am weak and I am foolish. Praise God for his mercy and grace to cover us. Praise God for what he so freely gives, not because we deserve it, not because we have earned it, but because he knows what is possible. He has seen us for who we really are. He has seen us for who he created us to be. That is who he desires. That is who he wants every single day. Be about your father's business. I actually have no idea what time it is, so I'm sorry if I've gone long. I want you to read, I'm not going to read it, but Isaiah 55, uh, verses 8 through 11. There's a scripture that talks about how God sends out his word and it will not return to him void. It's not the last day, but the last song that we always used to sing when I was a child going to the Feast of Tabernacles was, Go ye therefore unto all the world. And I used to think that the gospel would be preached wherever the people were living. And I've heard a different perspective on that recently that I want to share with you. God isn't telling us to go out into all of the world and preach the gospel. He is telling us that wherever we go to preach the gospel. If you go to the store, have a light in you to cause others to think. It's not so that you can see the result of your attitude or your anything, because there are many steps to kneel at the throne of God. And praise God for the times that we see our friends and our neighbors and our loved ones embrace that and choose him. But if we are doing our jobs, we will be merely one of the steps along the way over and over and over again. And you might not know the impact that you have in your faith on someone else. And glory be to God for that. Because if we saw our glory and what was being done in other people's lives because of our God, we would think how great I am. We are nothing in our flesh. 
We are created for glory, but we are not there yet. So let us be about our Father's business and serving Him in a way that is pleasing to Him. Let us be about our Father's business because He is for you and He will not be denied. Your Father loves you more than I can possibly express if I had the eloquence of Shakespeare. You can study how great He is. You can see the wonders that He has done in your daily life and still not begin to glimpse the barest beginning of it. What do the spirits around him do? Those in his presence praise him without ceasing. And it's still not enough because it's just an acknowledgement of who he is. Let us be aware of who he truly is. Let us be aware of what he has called us to become. And let us go into the world wherever we are, preaching his gospel, being his with everything that is in us. And when we fall short to fall back on our God, because he will give you what you need. I promise you, not because I, and don't, don't believe me because I say it, believe his word, read it, find what he says, and believe that word. Because if we are just here serving our time like a prison sentence on this earth, he'll be disappointed in us because he knows what he made us to do. He knows who we are. So whatever sin you have in your heart, and we all have some, whatever thing you have done in your life that you might think is too much, it's not. The creator of the universe has said so. And he says, you are mine. I am his. Praise be to God for his mercy. Praise be to God for the grace Praise be to God for the sacrifice of his son that we might have life and have it abundantly and have it everlasting. Let us be his wherever we go. Just let us be his. I want to leave you with one last thing. He is for you. I don't know if we understand how truly impactful that is. He is for you. He won't be stopped. He is for you. He is the creator of the universe and has all power. And he is for you. He says he will not be denied. He is for you. think I'm not good enough. He is for you. You think I have sinned and I have disappointed my God. He is for you. He wants you so desperately to know that. He sent his son to show us what it meant to serve, that we might have an example in this earth. Let us follow in his example, not merely by coming to the feast, It's such a good thing, and I'm so grateful for the opportunity to come here and to fellowship with you all and to feel his spirit fill us up, and the the praise music and the worship music, that's the, when I praise him, that is the doors opening, that is my soul being open to him, and I'm so glad that I have that opportunity now. That for many years was not something that, that happened easily. This is not This is not what we're called for. This is a shadow of what is to come. That the end of days is coming. And sometimes when we watch the news it feels like it's right around the corner. That does not change how you need to live your life. If he comes back tomorrow, praise be to God. If he comes back after you are gone from this fleshly existence, Praise be to God. His timing is perfect. But what he has done is said, I am for you in this life, and I desire you to serve me, and I desire to give you my spirit that you might live this life in a way that it impacts others so that they see me. So if there's one thing that I ask you to take from my message, remember, he is for you. He cannot be denied. 
We've already read the end of the story. We know what's coming. It's going to be awesome. So when he comes back, let us go to him saying, I have fallen short, but I did everything I could. And let us all desire with a, with a passion that we hear from him, well done, my good and faithful servant.